Hello. It's a pleasure to be here in Louisville. I'm here to talk about toilet paper. <laughs> Actually, what I do is I make art about everyday things. And I try to make, we've all heard all of these things before about climate change and about the things we're doing wrong. And for me, of course, we, we get tired. We all get tired of hearing the same thing over and over. Oh, well, we shouldn't fly in a jet plane because of the climate change impact. I fly in a lot of jet planes. But it's those everyday things we do which are having a real impact. And I try to make art that makes us think differently. Of course, we, I think we learn better. We, we take in a message better if we're entertained than if we're told. So I make art which, which has a message, and that message is all about these everyday things we do which are causing damage. And the impact, the positive impact we can, that, that we can all have by changing these things a little bit. This is the waste from the making of toilet paper. It's in Canada, in Thunder Bay. And this is deforestation for the making of toilet paper and the most popular facial tissues. Um, I try not to use uh, brand names because rather than vilify a particular uh, company, I would rather us change our behavior and, and therefore change the market by buying differently. If we buy one brand of toilet paper that's made from recycled uh, newspapers, then we're saving a forest. And as small a decision as that seems, the impact is major. And if the cost is slightly more, isn't that worth it if we save a forest? Um, so, and of course, as an artist, it's hard to picture certain things. How do we make an image of climate change? But again, art, I feel, uh, we're getting a little echo. Art, I feel, can tell us something where dialogue has failed, especially in our country where dialogue has become so vitriolic. We've, we've polarized in this country, and I, I think we could all agree that if we could pull back from that polarization, we'd be a lot better off. Fascinating. I, they told me that one of the great focuses of this festival would be about food, which, of course, is one of my favorite topics and uh, after art. And this, of course, is uh, the caves at Lascaux, our first knowledge of man-made art. And look what they're making art about, food. And of course, it's also activist art. They wanted a result from their art, right? They wanted, they probably didn't say, God, send us some more bison, but uh, essentially, that's what they were saying, I think. Um, as an artist, it's so hard. How do I make a picture of climate change? Sure, we can take a picture of, of, of uh, power plants, coal-burning power plants, which we know are one of the largest single causes of climate change. Um, this one, by the way, is just up the Ohio River from us. Uh, and this is the ash which they produce, which is just up the Ohio River and is leaching into the Ohio River and the groundwater in Shipping's Port. Um, but again, if I can make art which, which really gets the message out there, let's face it, we've all read about climate change. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, and my family doesn't really believe in climate change. Um, so if I can make art, and there's probably a few people here in Louisville that don't believe, that, like my family, complain about, well, we've had seven years of drought, and now it won't stop raining. And because, of course, one, well, I don't say anything. I don't say, ah, climate change. Um, but if we just all turned off the lights, maybe we wouldn't need so much coal. Um, 
you're in Kentucky, so hopefully you know something about mountaintop removal mining. I have not photographed it here in Kentucky, but I have photographed it in West Virginia. I'm, I kicked myself. I, I was talking downstairs with someone, and he asked about a certain picture, this one, and I kicked myself because the man who led me to this picture, who died last year, he was mm, about this tall, a, a West Virginia man, tough as nails. His name was Larry Gibson, and he's a model to anybody involved in mountaintop removal mining issues. This shot, it's actually the same place. Those woods are where I was hiding to take this shot. And it's really the quintessential mountaintop removal shot. I'm very, I'm very proud when one of my pictures becomes the defining picture of something, uh, <clears throat> even if it's mountaintop removal mining. But how crazy is it to be, to be cutting down a mountain to get a little bit of coal? And especially, again, back to food, which led me to water, which led me to include mountaintop removal mining, because, of course, the Cumberland Plateau is the source of water for so much of the southeast of the U.S. And Atlanta has been in drought for the last, what, 10 years? And I'm convinced that mountaintop removal mining, which is burying those streams, I try to draw those long connections, uh, which are hidden in our world. Who would know that if you buy a certain roll of toilet paper, that the boreal forest is being cut down to get it to us? It's not, no one tells us that. And why would we know, unless we're crazy enough to actually dig into the facts? But I think we need to be. I, that's, that's really the message of what I do is that we really must stop being consumers and be citizens. I think to be an adult means being responsible for the, the impact of, of everything we do. Um, and this is an issue I'll come back to. Uh, it's interesting to me that, that in, in this country, we, whenever someone protests something on the basis of an environmental message, the immediate rejoinder is jobs. Oh, well, we have to do that because of jobs. But in actual fact, this is Whiting. No, this is um, Twilight, West Virginia, which is right next to Whiting. It's a town where the coal mining is gone. And this is the post office in Twilight. That town was not enriched by coal mining. Time to talk about bacon. Um, this is one of my many favorite pictures. And uh, <clears throat> I would ask for a show of hands for anybody who wanted to guess what it was, but I'll just tell you. It's a picture of a lake, a lagoon of hog waste. The largest single toxic spill into an inland waterway in the United States wasn't an oil spill. It was a lagoon of hog waste, which spilled into the New River in North Carolina and killed everything in the river. Now, when we have that, and these are maps showing us where we're looking. We're looking at this uh, very wet area in North Carolina. The next picture is really bad. If you have a weak stomach, if you don't want to see something bad, I'm sorry. I, my personality is such that I must look at the bad. Um, this is a picture that might make a vegetarian out of you. If you don't want to see it, I recommend you close your eyes. It's not, it's not bondage and, and S&M. Um, but yes, it's, it's a gross, gross picture. Um, so here it comes. Um, these hogs, there are many reasons not to eat meat. Uh, there is the human health reason, there is the cruelty to animals reason, and there is the uh, environmental impact reason, and there are probably others. These are the ones that occur to me immediately. Um, 
I ate a little bit of, of meat today. They told me it was locally grown and raised. We are humans. We evolved eating meat. Uh, I don't think we evolved eating meat at every meal, which is what so many of us do. The approach that I have, in taking these pictures, what's happened to me is that I've changed my behavior. As I've learned these things, because there's a lot of research behind each of these pictures, it's forced me to change my behavior. I don't take a paper facial tissue. I carry a handkerchief. Uh, I get a lot of criticism for looking like a, um, a, a bedraggled uh, beatnik because I wear my clothes till the last thread. Um, these hogs, forgive me, I never stay on a straight line, but these hogs are kept in pens and you can see they stand on a graded floor. So everything, including that fetus that you saw, goes down through the floor and into these giant lagoons of hog waste. The, uh, the lagoons are, there's, if you're interested in this story, the, the, the best reporting is in Rolling Stone. And there's a quite funny bit where it talks about uh, a, a hog worker who falls in and his brother-in-law comes and tries to rescue him and he falls in and uh, they all die, of course. Um, which in itself is not funny, but the writing was so good. Um, so these lagoons are then sprayed out over fields. So these giant lagoons of hog waste, and you saw the factoid earlier, which says that hogs produce three times more waste than humans, uh, are sprayed out onto these fields. And this is all in a very wet area near New Bern, North Carolina. You'll see a shot of a very sick wetland in a minute. Um, here we see a farm, or we see three hog farms around what was a small farm. That small farmer had to leave his home and farm because of, it was a friend of his, this is an activist who guided me around down there, because of these three farms spraying this hog fecal matter. Can you imagine these? these high pressure sprayers spraying this stuff all day. I stood next to it, it's bad. And it's not just stinky. I mean, there's ammonia, there's a lot of bad stuff. So you can see this is a very wet area and they spray this. This shows you the hog sheds, the giant lagoon of waste and a spray field, which is of course right next to this wetland. Um, that is not a healthy looking wetland. One of my other guides on this project was a man named Don Webb, who I'm very fond of. And I said, Don, I really have to take your picture. And he gave me this goofy grin. And I said, no, no, Don, no. Come on, look mean. Anyway, that's, and I love this portrait. Um, again, back to, sorry, food, follow me here. Food, water. Uh, one of my pet issues is hydrofracking. I think you're not doing it here in Kentucky because the, uh, the strata doesn't permit it, but the impact is nationwide. Um, the price of gas in the U.S. is about a third the price of gas in the rest of the world due to the glut on the market from hydrofracking. This is, now hydrofracking as you saw on the map, what I'm looking at is mostly in Pennsylvania. It's rural Pennsylvania, which was an area, an agricultural area. Now it's an industrial area. And we're not in our country thinking about these long-term ramifications. Each hydrofract well, it's a two-stage process, by the way. First, the drill rig comes in and drills the, the well. Uh, this is waste from the drilling process. Now, layers of shale are radioactive. So this waste from drilling is radioactive waste. But of course, there is no provision for that. Pennsylvania is another state with very little uh, environmental regulation. So that waste is being sent to normal sewage treatment plants where the radioactive aspect passes right through 
and goes into our rivers. Um, you've probably heard of the volume of water that's used in hydrofracking. It's millions of gallons of water per frack per well, and they frack each well many times. This illustrates the fracking process. That illustrates how much water. Those tra tanker trucks are filling up that reservoir to frack that well after the drill team leaves and the fracking team comes. And you can see that farmhouse just above the well would fit inside that reservoir. That gives you some sense of how much water is used. And of course, again, food, water. Water's gonna be a crisis. The Ogallala Aquifer is gone. You know, that, that's fossil water and it's essentially empty. And yet we are, we're using water to get natural gas to keep the price of gas in the U.S. lower than the rest of the world. It doesn't, to me, it's not, it's not a recipe for a secure future. Um, I was talking to someone about, uh, about Fritz Haber, who is one of the great geniuses of the century. Um, he did one of, the thing, one of the most important things in the 20th century. He figured out how to synthesize nitrogen from air using natural gas. We use about 3% of our natural gas to make fertilizer. Um, fertilizer comes in, there are three essential elements to fertilizer. There's the nitrogen. All plants need these three nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The nitrogen, as you know, we get from, from, uh, from essentially burning air with natural gas. Um, the potassium we dig up from um, potash mines. And so the limiting factor is the, uh, is the phosphate, the phosphorus. Most of what we get comes from Florida, from these phosphate mines. Now, the interesting thing is, at our current rate of consumption, we've only got 40 years of phosphate left. Think about that. We've only got 40 years of fertilizer left at our current rate of consumption, and our rate of consumption is increasing. Um, that seems almost more serious than, than a gas crisis to me. These are pictures of the waste of the phosphate fertilizer mining process, which has a tremendous climate change impact too. Climate change is going to be that gorilla in the china shop which changes everything. And we, even though daily the reports come out which, which indicate that it is worse and happening faster than we imagined, what, three days ago, the uh, man who will probably be the Republican um, presidential candidate said that he, Rubio, said that it doesn't exist. Um, and this is, I'm always trying to tell, to, to get the pictures which illustrate the whole story. This is uh, Lake Champlain after a rainstorm, and you can see all of that fertilizer and, and sediment which have run down into that lake, which is causing these giant dead areas. You may know, um, we've, it sort of slipped out of the news, but in the uh, Gulf of Mexico is a dead area the size of I forget which state, a giant dead, let's call it the state of Rhode Island, a dead area in the Gulf of Mexico. We've forgotten about it after the uh, BP spill. Um, 40 years of phosphate fertilizer, there will be one country left which still has phosphate fertilizer. I would recommend buying real estate in Morocco. It's cheap now, but it won't be. And, uh, it's so rare to actually get wildlife impacted by an environmental issue. And these are pink roseate spoonbills flying over um, a phosphate tailings lagoon. 
I was very happy to get it. And it's, photography is such a wonderful thing. There's only one of this. I was in a plane, of course, and we circled around to get this, and I'm screaming at the pilot, circle faster, faster. And I shot, I got three frames before they flew away off the edge of, off the edge of that background. And there's only that one which is sharp. And it's always that way. There's only, there's one perfect picture. This is a picture of uh, the Gulf of Mexico looking from the water up into Louisiana of the sediment coming down uh, the Mississippi River. Uh, after World War II, of course, we had these industries, the bomb making industry, um, and by the way, another string I didn't tie was that the nitrogen which we need, the synthesized nitrogen, which is what we use for fertilizer, is also what we use to make bombs. And after World War II, all of those munitions factories became fertilizer factories. And similarly, the, the chemical weapons factories became pesticide factories. Um, we use a lot of pesticide in this country. I've gotten to the point where, where I will only eat organic um, because, again, what I've read. The other thing which scares me is uh, genetically modified foods. And it's amazing the volume which has entered our food stream. Um, it's being done by one company. This is where they make the, uh, the so if you don't know, the, um, they have modified the genes in a variety of crops, cotton, wheat, uh, sugar beets, there are a couple of others I won't bother to name them. They've modified these crops so that they tolerate the application of pesticides, of the most widely used pesticides. The chemical name is uh, glyphosate. I won't use the brand name. If you're interested, I'm sure you'll find it. Um, but this is where they make that most widely used pesticide in the country. Um, and again, I'm always trying to make that piece of art which tells the story. And it's often hard at these industrial locations. How do you make a piece of art from this rather boring uh, industrial location? So often I'm looking closely at something. I assume this is a waste pit. I don't know exactly what. Uh, I go to these places year in and year out. Um, and this is the same mechanical device over three different years. I think this one is 2010, this one is 2011, and this one is 2012. I have no idea what it is, I apologize. But it's fascinating to me the color change of this waste liquid. And that's just an agricultural field that I thought looked very desiccated and uh, I like the pattern. Again, I'm trying to tell a story. Uh, I'm eternally grateful to the pilots that fly me and, uh, and I'm also very grateful to the, the environmental groups which support me and, and give me information about what the, the good subjects are. And the other thing I try to do is, is make pictures which they can use. I try to be thinking about what the legislative issues are, and I try to make pictures which can be used in those fights, in, in those debates between, and I think it's a false debate, by the way, that debate between jobs and environment. I think if we don't address both issues, we lose. And there's some stories that, that I haven't been able to tell completely. This is cotton. Um, cotton is first a very water-hungry crop, and the Aral Sea in Russia was drained dry to irrigate cotton crops, and it's also the crop on which the most pesticides are used. So not only do I not use a paper facial tissue, I also uh, use my handkerchiefs until they have holes in them. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here.
And I would urge you all to think about really all those little things we do and what can we do better. And let's see if we can't uh, bridge that, that um, vitriolic gap in, that we seem to have in this country which has sort of stopped us from making progress. Thank you. I just want to thank you for that. It's very thought provoking. And um, one of the things that makes me think about was how, as a visual artist myself, how deceptive the visual is. That it's like um, you can create this beautiful image that I'm looking at and thinking how beautiful that is. And you tell me it's hog waste and how, how dangerous that is as a visual artist and what a responsibility it is in a visual culture to, um, to really think about what you're seeing and how you're seeing and how to train the eye to see because that which is aesthetically beautiful may actually be something quite poisonous. And so thank you for that. Um, I um, want to talk about that lens because um, my documentary about Wendell Berry is quite a challenge because he's someone who does not want to be filmed. So um, I never shy away from a challenge. In fact, I think the limitation is quite a gift as an artist. But um, so this film is really um, trying to imagine that lens of Wendell. I mean, I know Wendell. Um, he's so generous of spirit. And um, but how do you how do you how do you make a film about someone who doesn't want to film? made of him? How do you use what he thinks can be quite a corruptive tool, that being the camera, um, to try to sensitively paint a picture of him? And it's a challenge in which I am smack dab in the middle of that discovery. Um, and so I'm going to be talking to you about a film that is not finished, that is not refined, that is not at all complete, um, that I may have moments of clarity about, but um, am very, very much in the process of discovery. So um, it's a little bit of an interesting challenge for me to talk about something that I'm not really quite ready to talk about, uh, but it's a gift as well. Um, I came here today straight from Henry County, Kentucky, because that's where we are right now filming for this film, and only Asley could convince me to break my focus in shooting and come here, and it's really a blessing, so thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to show you a couple excerpts from that film, but what I want to start with is an audio clip um, in the spirit of Wendell, so that you have to imagine rather than um, rely on the screen to tell you what to see. Um, and it's just an audio clip. I've had a series of interviews with Wendell, all audio, of course, and I wanted to play you my favorite moment in all of these interviews because to me, it crystallizes at this point why I'm making this film and the message of hopefulness that Wendell is teaching me. So let's play that. It's just three or four minutes. You know, a long time ago when I visited with you, I talked about that Yeats poem, The Second Coming, and how that was one of the most profound poems mm -hmm. I had ever read. Mm -hmm. And that theme, unfortunately, seems to define the world that I've come of age in. And so there's this need to try to find a way to piece things back together. So you look to places where there is still a remnant of togetherness or unity or community, um, a connection to the land. And I study those because I don't come from a place, I come from divorce and, you know, you write about mobility. I mean, I grew up moving pretty much every year of my whole life. So it's like these... We all come from divorce now. This is an age of divorce. Things that, that belong together have been taken apart. And you can't put it all back together again. What you do is the only thing that you can do. You take two things that ought to be together and you put them back together. Two things, not all things. That's the way the work has to go. You make connections in your work. I reckon, I'm no filmmaker, but uh, you will put this film together by seeing how uh, part of the parts of it belong together. So that the film, the, the made thing, becomes a kind of an earnest of your faith in and your affection for the great coherence that we miss and would like to have again. I hope so. That's a beautiful well, that's, possibility. That's what we do with I, people who make things. <laughs> if it's a stool or a film or a poem, 
or an essay or a novel or a musical composition. It's all about that. Finding how it fits together and fitting it together. It's like a therapy, you know, when you can fit things back together because I do think there is this like overwhelming theme of disillusion in, in our in our culture and our everything in our land and everything. Yeah, but that's kind of a reasonless conclusion to come to. Uh, and it comes from people's acceptance of the money economy as the only economy. Uh, the world in fact, uh, unless you're in prison, uh, is full of free things that are delightful. Flowers. They're not free, but it won't be long till we'll be having free flowers around here. Mm, right. we'll come back. The woods will be full of them. The yard will be full of dandelions. So people, but the world is also full of people who'd rather pay for something to kill dandelions than to appreciate the dandelions. <laughs> so I'm a dandelion man myself. <laughs> so you see what a privilege it is to be instructed by Wendell. Um, I think, I think like um, Jay Henry that you know, I do make art as a response to a world that doesn't make sense. And you often question, am I doing this in vain? Am I doing this for the right reasons or the wrong reasons? And um, that quote helps me understand what I was doing and why I was doing. And um, before I f um, started this project, I was working, I made a film called The Unforeseen. And it's about um, my hometown, Austin, Texas, and the destruction therein. Uh, a beautiful spring-fed pool in the middle of Austin is being polluted by all of the real estate development and money coming in. And it's really just meant to be as a metaphorical reflecting pool for what's happening all over our, our land. And um, as someone who, who was taught by my parents and who um, very much internalizes a deep love for the natural world, it's sort of a, really one of the only things that can comfort a soul in my, in my mind. Um, to see it destroyed around you all the time as you're growing up is painful. And I came to a place in my late 20s when I was working on The Unforeseen where I had run the math and, and we were doomed. It was over. It was done. And I had my own journey of, of profound despair as you know, a relatively young person looking out at the future and really seeing nothing to hope for, everything I love being slowly or quickly destroyed. And it was a poem by Wendell that became a kind of road map for me when I was working on that film. It was one of his Sabbath poems, and it's called Santa Clara Valley. And it's this um, description of a walk through the deserted prospect of the modern mind, where nothing um, was, everything was man-made. We had completely effaced the divine and put our own ugly image on top of it and uh, it was bleak, it was all concrete. Wendell told me later it was a walk in Silicon Valley. And, um, and yet, at the end of this walk, he came across a little pool of water. And in that pool of water, there were all kinds of birds and life springing forth. And how hopeful that was to me, that um, there is a power beyond me. The unforeseen was a refrain in that poem over and over and over again. It was the hope in the unforeseen that um, surprised him. And it surprised me. And it continues to surprise me. As, and that poem became a road map because it was as if I cannot plan it all out. I cannot grid it all out. Everything that I see in the math I'm doing is not the whole story. And that in itself is hopeful. The mystery um, and so that poem became a, a very important for me in making that film, remains important to me. And when I made that film and toured it, it had a reading of Wendell. Wendell read the poem for me for the film, and, and I titled the film The Unforeseen, and we toured it all over the place. And I was incredibly dismayed at how few people seem to really know Wendell's work. We all think of him as... Um, you know, enormously significant, and yet I was at the San Francisco Film Festival in front of a lot of supposedly educated environmentalists who had no idea who Wendell Berry was. So I thought, okay, I'm going to use these tools to try to make a film that points 
to his work because more people need to read it and discover it. And um, so that said about this journey. So this film is, right now is called 40 Pains, a portrait of Wendell Berry. It still is a portrait in my mind, but if you think of um, the pains, you're going to see them in the clip here in a minute. It's not the way the world sees Wendell, because he would not want it that way, but it's really imagining the way Wendell sees the world. So Henry County, Kentucky is his place that he loves so dearly and that I have fallen in love with. You can't help it. So the, the landscapes of the film and the people in the stories are really the people, his neighbors, his friends, the people in his landscape. So we have been filming, um, the goal is to film across all four seasons. We filmed fall and we filmed winter and we're right in the middle of filming spring and we hope against all hopes to be back this summer and have those four seasons and do a, a picture and um, it's hard for me to describe to you the film, as I've said, because it's very much um, in thousands of pieces in my mind. So I'm going to show you a 22-minute cut. I think it will, um, uh, it will convey much more than my words can convey about what this film is trying to do and how the portrait um, in the spirit of Wendell, the way Wendell has for me, um, really builds in you a kind of hopefulness when you least expect it. So this is uh, 22 minutes and it's from the fall shoot. And um, after that, I'm gonna show you a quick four minute montage, because that's all I had time to edit, um, of the winter footage. And it says a springboard for spring, but I'll probably say a couple quick words before I show that. So this, you can settle in and watch about 22 minutes. So I'm, I'm almost done with the presentation, but um, I did wanna show you um, a little bit of the winter footage. And, It'll be um, sort of my version of a moment of silence because there's no talking in this. It's just some imagery, but as we're into spring, it's, um, there's something nice about looking at this really cold footage and remembering how cold it was here just a few months ago, painfully cold, and how beautiful it is now, and that you can come from that darkness and emerge into a spring, and that we do it every single year. There's something so hopeful in that to me. And I do want to say one other thing that I thought about when I was watching um, that is that, you know, reflecting on my own lens as a mother of five little boys, um, yeah, I know, it's absolutely insane and wonderful and reminds me every minute of every day how little control I have. But, um, yeah, thankfully, but um, uh, just that, you know, I, I think that part of my despair came from when I was younger and it was so important to me to point out how, how wrong everything was and how horrible everything was. And it's true that it is in many ways. But I do, I am grateful for just the gift of motherhood because I think it, it places in your heart and, um, you know, just the necessity of hope. Wendell will say that hope's a virtue, so you've got to have it. And I appreciate that, but it's hard to just have something. And I do have that now, and I think it really is, is a necessity when you have children. I cannot be the mother that I want to be if I have no joy in my heart. So you find that hope uh, when you least expect it. And... So I'm grateful just for this presentation. I'm not going to talk after this. I just want to leave you with this. I'm grateful for the chance to do this today because in some ways I didn't know how much this film was about healing. Um, I think you saw it. I don't think I saw it as clearly as I do as I've reflected on it. So um, thank you for that. And just this is just four minutes with music and imagery of your last incredibly cold <laughs> winter in Kentucky. Well, I don't know about other members of the audience, but I feel so healed after that film. And I felt so damaged watching Henry's pictures, beautiful though they are. So I do think that we have fulfilled the spirit of the evening and also the, uh, reflected what Wendell Berry wrote about in his, his wonderful book, which many of you may have read, called What Are People For? And if you haven't read it, I hope you will. But that's where the essays, Damage and Healing, first appeared. Henry, I have to ask you, why is this damage so beautiful? There's something really powerful about the beauty of the images that you create. Well, thank you. Of course, it begs the question, which we can't discuss unless someone brought a nice glass of bourbon, uh, what is beauty? But let's sidestep that question. 
I utilized the rules of making two-dimensional art, which were essentially discovered in the, in the Renaissance or, or rediscovered, to create images that are graphically beautiful. And I'm dying to know where you found that old printing press. Mm. Um, Monterey. In Monterey, California, Kentucky. 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 That's a great Kentucky. site. Mm. It's it's yeah, so it's beautiful. But, sorry, uh, but I'm purposefully making them beautiful. I'm using these rules of two-dimensional artwork to make something beautiful out of something which is, of course, not beautiful. And it is the dissonance that's created there which makes the images effective because they're beautiful. Your, one part of your brain is telling you it's beautiful, another part of your brain is telling you it's horrible, and that dissonance is why they're effective. Laura, it seems much harder to me uh, for you to show the pain in Henry County that's there mm. because it is so visually appealing, mm. summer, winter, spring. But there were scenes that we saw, particularly the faces of the farmers, I thought, were astonishingly poignant. And the fears that they have, which are with them always, mm. that kind of stress. Do you, will there be more of this in your film, the, the sense of, of despair that the small farmer continues to feel? Yeah, it's part of the danger of falling in love with your subject, you know. Um, I think that uh, it's a good question. I think that Wendell has a way of, you know, in his words, it, it make, so often it makes you hurt and hope all at the same time. There's a poignancy to the beauty. Um, I think that I'm so used to seeing documentaries about how bad things are and how um, poor and desperate rural America is that I'm more interested in the dignity of the place and the people, and I'm more interested in um, showing beauty that is still preserved, real beauty, not necessarily just aesthetic beauty, you know? But um, I'm more interested and compelled by that than I am the brokenness. But I think, you know, I think the brokenness and the beauty are one and the same, and I think um, it's a matter of how to, how to frame it you know, to see what you want to see in it, to move where you want to go from that place, if that makes sense. It does. Henry, I want to ask you to repeat for the audience a story that you tell in your book about uh, taking the train home from Manhattan to the suburb where you live and the experience of walking home from the station while all of your well-to-do neighbors see you. Tell, tell us that story just a little bit. <clears throat> well, it's, it's funny what, it's funny where our heads are in our world in the USA today. We're all terrified of terrorists, but you won't die from a terrorist. You will die from a refrigerator falling on you before you will die for, from a terrorist. <laughs> The story that we're referring to is that of, again, by virtue of taking these pictures, I, I have been forced to change my behavior. And one of the things I did, I was living in a wealthy suburb north of Manhattan. I would hitchhike to work. Uh, sorry, to the train. And people said, now remember, we're in a wealthy suburb. We're in Westchester. Nothing, I will not be raped, murdered, robbed or anything in Westchester. But I was astonished at the amount of, of indignation, fear, shock, and awe because I was hitchhiking the 10 miles to get the suburban commuter train. <laughs> and I was also fascinated by the people who would roar by in their giant vehicles and give me looks of, of disgust at this person in his blue jeans, hitchhiking to the commuter train. And I'm, I'm, always, I'm always obsessed by, okay, and we all do it. Was it, who, was, it, was it Wendell Berry that said, we're all guilty? We are all guilty. Mm -hmm. And of course, but there are these people who are very well-to-do, zooming by in their gas-guzzling cars, and 
these are the things which are, which are doing us in. And I always wondered, the story he refers to is me standing there while these people zoom by and thinking, yeah, but what, that's just it. You're zooming by, you're not helping your neighbor. You're zooming by in your gas guzzling car and yes. There's one other thing in that, in that segment of the book that you refer to. And ever since I read it, I have been unwilling to have a bottled uh, a bottle of water. And why, why would that be that I would be so unwilling to do that? Uh, well, first off, don't get me started. Well, that's what I want. First to off, a third of the volume of a, a bottle of water in oil is used to get that bottle of water into your hand. That's the, the I think that's, that's the factoid. But more recently, my new obsession is uh, BPA. And of course, plastic leaches BPA into whatever it contains. So aside from the oil use, the climate change, and all of those things, and by the way, the, uh, the, the water loss caused by these giant water companies moving into communities and, and sucking up the groundwater, is the fact that you're taking in BPA. I, w I would not, I will not cook out of a, a pan with, with nonstick coating and I won't, I won't consume food or water out of plastic. Mm. Good for you. Uh, but I'm guilty too of some of those things. And I mean, we all are. you have to become aware and that's one of the values of, of the work that you're doing, I think. Both of you. Um, Laura, tell us a little bit about the experience of going into a place like Henry County as an outsider mm -hmm. and what it was like. Um, were people a little bit hesitant to talk to you initially? Mm -hmm. And how did you break that down? They're still hesitant. Um, yeah, Kentucky's an interesting place. My family's from Mississippi and uh, Louisiana. And I found working in the Deep South a lot easier than working in Kentucky. Really? Yeah, I mean, I, I just think that um, I'm Kentucky, I love Kentucky, but um, yeah, people make you earn it. They don't just give it to you. And I thought Wendell, I knew Wendell was like that. I mean, he makes me earn it every single time I see him. It's as if the first time I met him and I have to work really hard um, for the next two hours to have any worth whatsoever. Um, and I appreciate that. But um, I feel like most people here are that way. And it seems like a cultural thing. I don't think it's just um, being out in a rural area. Although I did hear someone say today that um, we were talking about this issue and said that people out in like rural Kentucky, you know, they really are very mistrusting of people from Louisville. Oh, yes. And uh, that it didn't matter who it was, it was just that dichotomy. Yeah. So that's, I'm sure, a part of it. I don't have a whole lot of experience in the city. My experience is really out there. But um, I have found also that uh, people in Kentucky are not, people out there at least, are not terribly impressed with a camera or the fact that you're making a movie, that that's quite a liability. And um, it takes a while. So, but you know, my approach is um, I'm there for the long haul. I, um, documentary is certainly the document, is like the art form of endurance. And so um, I keep coming back and back and back and back and hang out and stay and um, humble myself and go through great pains <laughs> to be there. And over time, you know, there is an opening and a trust that's building, but you have to earn it big time here. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I, um, you know, documentaries, uh, although they're hard to do and they're often hard to sell, uh, I think there's a growing market for them now. And the fact that Netflix, for instance, has mm -hmm. whole uh, channels devoted to documentaries is really quite exciting. Mm. How long will your film be when it's finished? I would guess around 80 minutes, somewhere mm. in there. Have you ever tried doing uh, motion pictures, Henry, or have you stuck to stills? A little bit. F filmmaking is, I, I, I've done enough of it to, to, to have the greatest respect for anyone who can, it's an impossible thing. Mm -hmm. it, does, <laughs> it, it how, uh, I'm lucky in that I'm essentially a one-man band mm -hmm. with, the, uh, with the people who fly me or whatever. 
So I don't have to worry about will the cameraman show or will he have or she have a good day or will the, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So psh, I don't understand how they ever get done. Mm -hmm. Well, I did think that Wendell's quote at the beginning that you played <laughs> was fascinating and the idea of putting together the pieces, whether it be words in a poem mm -hmm. or whether it be images from a, a strip of film, or I guess today it would be a digital image from whatever, or all the pieces of film that you have to edit together mm -hmm. in order to make a movie. Yeah. How do you keep all that straight <laughs> in your mind? I mean. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's a jumbled mess. No, I do edit my own films and it takes a long time and Wendell often gives me a hard time about the fact that this film's taking me years upon years, aside from the fact that I keep having children. But I told him that, you know, he's a member of every slow movement there is. So this is the, like, the, the movement of slow filmmaking. <laughs> and I have to examine, you know, I could hire an editor. That would probably be a wiser thing to do. But um, instead, you know, I edit it all myself. And so it, because I want to know it, I need to know it, I need to understand it and feel it and experience and see how I think it naturally fits together. I think a lot of filmmakers, um, documentary filmmakers, are really out with a political agenda, and um, I'm not. I think that I'm interested in the complexities and learning about things and trying to see the world differently than the way I see it. So I go into a film with ideas, and I uh, hope to get completely lost and confused and turned around and find my way out so that the process itself transforms the way I see it. Well, so it's the, messy and expensive and very slow. Yeah. <laughs> And do your sons get in there and mess up the pieces? Oh, or? yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Are you shooting film? No, we're shooting, uh, no. Yeah. We're shooting on um, HD. Yeah. But, you know, it, 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 it feels like film in the way you edit it because the software that I use, I don't know if this is interesting to anybody, we could talk, but it, it, it simulates film. So you're actually editing the frames. Mm -hmm. It's just you're not doing it on a steam back, you're doing it with a mouse yeah. and a keypad. That's how I work, at least. So it is like a puzzle of many, many thousands of photographs. Yeah, sure. Yeah, with sound to complicate things. <laughs> and it does. <laughs> uh, Henry, uh, we just mentioned some of the problems Laura had with the people in uh, Henry County, but mm -hmm. I would think that any industrialist who sees you coming would <laughs> call out the guards or the dogs or something. Do you, ha do you have to be pretty sneaky to get around it? I heard you mention you were in the woods at one point. I've, uh, of course, I, most of this is done aerially. Mm -hmm. yes. So I swoop in and am gone before they are able to marshal the dogs. I have had the FBI waiting for me when I get on the ground when, for instance, I was circling repeatedly over a refinery and they called in the tail number of the plane and they tracked that down to the airport from whence. And it's happened more than once, and they question me extensively, but I'm pretty transparent. Mm. I'm, I'm an artist, there's nothing, I, if somebody with bad intention wants, wants a tool, well, Google Earth is, uh, is, is much more illustrative of what is where mm. than I am. I'm making art. Most of your photos that I saw, at least in the book that we have on sale in the lobby and that these pictures are from, uh, are in the eastern half of the United States. Do you limit your uh, travels to this part of the country, or do you do the whole Not world? Not at all. As a matter of fact, I travel around the world. I decided to make the book a narrative about the project. So it, and the project started on the Mississippi River in what's known as Cancer Alley, right. um, which is, I, I love the Mississippi for what it represents to us as a nation, uh, so many things, I won't even start. Um, one of the things I want to do is the, the lost slave towns mm. that were, were swept aside by the industries that moved into the area. But that's why the book focuses mostly on the eastern, and I'm from the southeast. So. So interestingly enough, when I was talking about my own journey of despair, I, when I was in grad school, I'm from New Orleans, and I made a film called Green about the environmental racism along Cancer Alley. And we rented a helicopter and shot aerial film above all of those refineries, like in Baton Rouge. And you can see the proximity of the little slave, former slave plantations against the 
ginormous uh, uh, quality of the plant. So I should, we should exchange notes. <laughs> I, um, I found one of my deep throats is a man who used to work in the government in mm. Baton Rouge. Is it Willie Fontenot? It is, right? He I just know. said deep throat. <laughs> <laughs> well, he knows everything. I, he does. He knows everything. You can show him a picture yeah, of anything, one. and he'll say, oh, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the Bassif plant. And, and he's yeah. legally blind. And he's legally blind. Yeah, yeah. he's and a blind he, photographer. He's <laughs> a wonderful. Yeah. Uh, it's too funny. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I guess everybody finds their way into Willie and Mary's house, mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've, I've always wondered, and I should have asked Mary this at some point, or Wendell, but do they have air conditioning in their house? Mm -hmm. Oh, they do? But they have a lot of solar panels. Okay, okay. And how do they heat it? Mm, I don't know. Mm, just curious. It's warm. They have a, a furnace in their, in their living room. Yeah. The... Um, in Kentucky, a lot of the of the rural areas have thrived in some ways because of air conditioning. Because mm -hmm. it, the summers here can be pretty sultry, not as bad as Mississippi, but mm -hmm. they can be pretty warm. And they've gotten warmer in the last few um, decades because of global warming. Mm -hmm. um, when you go into Newcastle in the town. Do you find that the people in the town are different from the people in the country because the berries talk so much about community mm -hmm. and how they're woven together? Do, do you sense that, or do you sense a difference between the, the farmers the and, town? The, and the townspeople? No, I think it's all sort of the same thing there because the town is so teeny tiny, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, the town seems to be where, like just we were there today filming a group of young farmers, but we filmed them in the county judge's office. Um, and when we were standing in the front yard, uh, three of my main characters walked by in the course of about 30 minutes because they were dropped, it was great. And they dropped off, were dropping off paperwork or running errands or dropping their kid at preschool. So I think that in these communities, you know, the, the rural communities, this, the town is a kind of hub for certain kinds of activity, right. banking, legal work, school. So I think there's a, there's a wholeness in community there that is so inspiring, even though the old timers there will tell you how much it's changed and how much they're losing. I still see it as a place where there's something truly preserved in contrast to a place like Austin, mm -hmm. where everything is kind of feels fractured and there isn't that sense of wholeness. There, you know, everybody knows everybody and neighbors are neighbors and there's something preserved and something I am very inspired by. But I don't see that difference. I mean, the town, Newcastle and the farms around it are, seem to be part of the same thing rather than the dichotomy versus like Newcastle versus Louisville. Right. Um, the theme of our festival is sacred earth, sacred self. What can you tell us from your art about what it means to be a sacred self? What is sacred selfhood? You want to start, Henry? Well, I'm not a religious person, but I do believe there's something. There's something more which many people attribute to God or, or specific religion. But I do believe that the body is a temple. The body is sacred. The body is also a mirror of the larger world. And, and I, I believe firmly in the connectedness of everything. Mm -hmm. And what we do to our bodies uh, and I also believe in responsibility and do unto others and what we do to our bodies is what we should do to the larger world, for the larger world, and for others. And um, which of course has, has, all of this has been informed by what I do and the research involved and, and has, as I said, affected the way I live. I don't have an answer, but I have some thoughts. I think, um I think a lot about that in the context of working on this film because it's like, how do you define self? And one of the big reasons that I understand why Wendell doesn't want to film about him is because he would say, I am nothing um, without those people around me to whom I'm connected. 
And I think in our urban, increasingly urban lives, um, it's much more vain. It's much more about what you're wearing and who you are and your Facebook and your social media identity. And there's this kind of overwhelming narcissism in our culture today that I do not see when I am in uh, the places I'm in right now because I think people are much more defined by their need for one another and their place in the natural order of providing things from the bounty God's given us. So. I think that there's a much healthier sense of self um, in these places that our larger fancy culture kind of disregards. There's a secret there about self that I'm only kind of getting glimpses of and trying to learn about. Well, I think both of you through your art are, are helping us to understand ourselves and who we are as people on this earth. And uh, we're about ready to get questions from the audience, but while we have a moment, I want to thank you for that. Thank you. And for sharing these beauty, beauty, beautiful things mm -hmm. with us mm -hmm. and also making us aware of the horror that we, mankind, have created. Mm -hmm. so maybe we could have some lights and some questions. I remember Wendell was doing this last night, and I know how he <laughs> felt. Yes, down on thank the Thank you. Row. Um, I want to thank you for the lens of your heart, because I think that's what you see um, through your heart with all of your pictures. Um, Jay Henry, this is for you. You've been all over the world and taken pictures of some pretty awful things. Is there any place in our world that you see as still pristine or still lovely to look at from an airplane? Mm -hmm. There, phew, that, mm -hmm. that sort of touches to the question of is there hope? Um, there's so many beautiful places. There are, there, there's a great man um, dead now, Dave Foreman, who mm -hmm. started an organization called the Wildlands Institute, who I work with, the Wildlands Institute, not Dave Foreman. And I read something he wrote about being in Alaska and saying, wow, this is what it's supposed to be like. No, we have, we humans have changed everything. There is still great beauty. Um, I'm from the South, I love the South. Uh, I'm hearing these things about Henry County, which makes me want to go there and see it. There is great beauty and there's much, there is much that is, to be celebrated and enjoyed. Um, the human animal has pretty much changed everything. It's what we do. And yes, there's a lot that's beautiful that I see that, that makes me almost weep. Don't, please don't let that be destroyed also. Yeah, but there, there are many places. Let's hope we can say we can stop ourselves. Could you name one? I'm particularly fond of the southeast. Um, the, the, there's a large wild area in South Carolina called the, um, the Ace Basin. It refers to the area where three rivers, I think it's the largest relatively intact wild area on the east coast, where three rivers come together, the Ashipu, the Kumbi, and the Edisto. And uh, it's one of my favorite places. We're, we're, my family is trying to, to resuscitate the longleaf pine, mm -hmm. um, which is near and dear to my heart. So yeah, that's, that's but that, do, we all go, do we all look to home? Mm -hmm. Do we all look to where we were born as our, I think we almost do, don't mm -hmm. we? I think that's but yeah, I'd love to see more of Kentucky. Thank you. Another question, please. Over here. Uh, my question is for Laura. I'm a transplant to Kentucky, and uh, while I despise smoking in the tobacco industry, I've become pretty fascinated with the tobacco farming history. And I'm curious if you chose tobacco specifically for your film, or if that just happens to be the environment that Wendell's in. Yeah, it's the environment. I didn't set out to do a film about tobacco. And um, 
And yet, I think I too have become quite um, moved by the culture around tobacco. I mean, there's the plant itself, which is pretty fascinating, but I think it's the culture around the tobacco farming that Wendell writes so beautifully about. And I see it. I see what he's writing about, that um, it, because it's a handmade craft, it still cannot be mechanized. They're trying, but they just can't quite mechanize it. And um, there, is, there is a handmade craft to it. Of course, that's changing dramatically now because so much of it's run by contracts and Philip Morris, and that's a whole other story. But one thing I would say about it that I'm compelled about is that I'm used to documentary film world. The scene around documentary films is quite about political correctness. And so I love that I tried to tell them, yes, I'm making a film about you know, white male tobacco farmers in the South <laughs> and how beautiful they are. <laughs> um, is, 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 um, it's kind of as Wendell would have it, right? If they think you're going to go right, go left. Because it's not, it's, it's very much a disregarded culture. It's a throw the baby with, out with the bathwater. And I have learned from the berries mainly, and then the farmers that I'm around, you know, that there's so much to be learned from that art and that craft and that culture that really has been quite disregarded. Another question, please. Um, I don't know quite how to ask the question, mm -hmm. and yet I feel, if I can, I'm curious if you might know what an andon cord is. An andon cord? Mm-hmm. In, in industrialization, in running the Ford plant or Toyota, the andon cord is the one that the worker can stand up and pull, and that shuts down the whole assembly line, wow. the system. Oh, wow. So to ask you a little bit of how would you see a populist farmer's movement mm. get hold of its andon cord? Mm. Interesting question. And then my second question, <laughs> or would y'all like to stand this? Isn't it just a little bit strange for Wendell Berry to be looking out a window, not just a window, but one whole window that has 40 panes. Why 40? I asked him that. I said, is there any significance to the number whatsoever? And he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was searching for some mystical answer, and he said no. But it is, a, it is an interesting fact, isn't it? So if you're looking at nature through systems thinking, you begin to realize the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. So you got all of these economies working and trying to pay the debts, but how do you get the solitude, the integrity of the small farmer to coalesce without putting the money into the political machinery that begins to tilt towards the big operations that drain the money very quickly out of its operations. Well, I think Steve Smith, he's the farmer who tells his story about being a tobacco farmer and then saying, this is not going to work, and finding another path. That's why I love his story so much. And he's Wendell's son-in-law, by the way. But um, I love that story so much because it shows you a way to you're not trapped within a certain way of thinking. If you're willing to take that leap and put down the, 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 the way everyone else is going and try to imagine something different, there are possibilities. And within 15 years, he paid off his farm. He's out of debt. He's, he's great, you know? And um, whereas a lot of the other farmers, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They never get out of debt. Um, and it's a different picture. So I think that's a good example that it is possible. You're not just... It's not just a, you know, um, a fait accompli that there's no way to get out. It's Let's see, when I was a child about your age, I would be working down in the cotton country mm. to, trying to teach school in Helena. Mm. And I met, there was an article written about building the Slackwater Harbor, but there's this wonderful lady farmer who owned probably a couple hundred thousand acres the bank and the implement company, but she realized that she could begin to make more money by not using as much pesticide. Mm. It wasn't the 
volume of cotton, it was the cost of what went in to yield a crop. So in junior and high school, she paid for the Philadelphia Orchestra to come to Arkansas for its sesquicentennial. And it was such a fascinating experience to see that. So I would wonder, as I would write as a senior in the Central High about Appalachian folk music, how do you get or appeal to the folk song players? Really, the songs are being sung, and they're in the meals that are broken. How do you coalesce and then pull the sort of humor that rural people love to do and can pull it off with the fidelity, integrity that everyone says, we did this ourselves. It's not one person. We're sort of channeling a spirit. That's and to do really, it well. That's a really good thought. And we're, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop here. Thank you. Because I have just a few moments left to remind you of tomorrow's program. And it is an exciting one. Uh, you'll notice from your program that we will again begin with guided meditation led by Gerardo Abud. Be here at 9 o'clock for that. Then at 10.30, we're going to have a really interesting program called Just Sustainabilities, Reimagining Equality and Living Within Limits. And the, uh, our guide for this will be Dr. Julian Ajaman from Tufts University. He's internationally known uh, for his research in this area. And we're going to have a really good local panel with him to discuss some of the issues that he raises, including Gene Dunlop, Teresa Zawaki, and Ted Smith. Then tomorrow afternoon, we're going to have a session with the Bioneers. And many of you are aware of their uh, full spectrum leadership for engaged action, body, mind, and spirit. We'll have Kenny Ausubel and Nina Simons here tomorrow afternoon, 2.30 PM. And at noon, I'm sorry, at uh, 12, uh, I think at 12.15, 12.30, there will be a seminar, Sacred Living Within the Home. Uh, it's a one and a half hour workshop, and we will explore ways that we can use intention, prayer, and ritual to bring spiritual presence and sacredness to mundane family dynamics. It sounds like we could all use that session. It will be at 12.45 tomorrow, up on the mezzanine. So now we have uh, just a few minutes left. I wanted to ask each of you if you had a, a one minute parting shot. Is there something that you would like to leave with us tonight that we haven't covered? Laura? <laughs> Not really, <laughs> I'm really tired. <laughs> okay. But I do wanna say thank you. It's been really nice we to We wanna say thank you to you. Henry? Well, I'm by nature a soapbox preacher. And uh, I guess my parting shot would be turn off the lights when you leave the room. Mm -hmm. Aww.